So point, reason, point, and that can be used to answer essentially any type of question. There's always going to be a main message at the beginning, some explanation in the middle. And then if you end with your main message, there's a reason that this is so powerful and important in conversations, because there's a couple terms in psychology called the primacy and recency effects. So what that basically means is we remember the things we hear first and the things we hear last the most. So if we start and end with that main point, that's going to be the thing that people are going to remember and take away the most. Welcome back to The Better and Rich Show. We got Ty Hosgen on the podcast. Uh, he is a communication coach, two-time best-selling author, the founder of Advanced Growth Institute, and uh, he helps professionals communicate with confidence, charisma, and clarity so they can get more respect, become stronger leaders, and advanced, advance their careers. Uh, we go in a lot of different directions, uh, especially about tone and voice inflection. That's really po a powerful shift for me, especially in my days with Cutgo and being in direct sales. Uh, this is um, some specific nitty gritty nuance when it comes to communication that I think you're really going to enjoy. And uh, one of the things that uh, that he offers at the end of our conversation is his five science backed video uh, call secrets. Every professional needs to know. And he gives it to you for free at www.videocallstar.com. Uh, that link is also in the show notes. So another great conversation on the Better Than Rich Show, Ty Hosgen uh, from uh, Toronto, Canada. Get ready. Here we go. Welcome back to the Better Than Rich Show. I'm Mike Abramowitz, and I am here with Ty Hosgen from Canada. Hey, eh? welcome to the Better Than Rich Show, brother. Thanks, Mike. Great to be here. That's the first time I've heard the joke. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. You know, uh, we 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 want to be original here on the show. Um, here's the deal: you have a, a very unique genius that I don't know if we've had anyone on the show really jam on some of the things that you're an expert at, and. One of the things that I used to teach, I used to run a leadership academy for one of my previous companies, and we used to talk about inflection and voice and tone on how if you're trailing up at the end of every sentence and it constantly sounds like this and it keeps going up, that's sending a certain message to the recipient. And if you constantly go down and every time you finish a sentence, you go down and it ends on this down tone. So we used to teach this, but to actually have an expert on our podcast that can really add some value here and context into the tone and the language and context and voice. I mean, this is going to be really a fun conversation. So why don't we start there with this idea of communicating with confidence, charisma, clarity. Uh, what is the significance of these uptones and downtones? And obviously, I was teaching my lens of this for like, you know, 10 years. But to get your expertise on that would be pretty fun to start. Let's start there. Well, first of all, Mike, you absolutely nailed going up in pitch at the end of your sentence where everything sounds like a question. And so this is something that a lot of people aren't aware that they're doing until they hear a recording. Most people also don't record themselves, so they have no idea they're making this mistake. A lot of times this happens when we're a little bit nervous, we're speaking about something important. So basically all the times that you want this to happen the least is usually when it happens the most. And so if we're going up in pitch, like I'm doing right now, it makes you sound really unsure of yourself and kind of uncertain. It's got that question sounding tone. So doing the opposite, like you demonstrated well too, Mike, is going down, going down in pitch. The meeting is on Thursday, not the meeting is on Thursday. And so it's really a very key difference between sounding certain, sounding assertive, authoritative versus sounding unsure, kind of timid, a bit passive about anything that you're saying. So it's a huge credibility killer to be going up in pitch like that. And it's almost like you're a singer where you're going from a lower note to a higher note if we're going up and sounding unsure. And then to think of it the opposite way, to sound more confident, more clear, just to go down in pitch from a higher note to a lower note. So my curiosity then stems, we, so we as communicators, business owners, mainly people that are listening to the show, who are, we, who are the people that we're having these types of conversations with? They're probably prospects, they're probably clients, and they're probably internal team or talent. 
What would you say is some of the counsel that you offer as far as use cases of, of being really intentional with uptones, downtones, inflections, certainty, uh, where this is how you would want to intentionally use this type of inflection for this scenario, for the, for prospecting, for this scenario in sales or, or like with clients, this is in fulfillment. This is how you'd really want to be able to use your intentional tone and confidence. And when you're working with your talent and team, this is a perfect example. So I know I'm probably pulling out some specifics that maybe are like behind paywalls, but I think this is what our listener really wants is what is the practical use case for those three camps of communication and and how could how might someone be intentional even more intentional than they are already yeah it's a great question we can definitely dive into everything behind the paywalls i'm an open book here for you today <laughs> so the the use cases think of the most important things that you're going to say so if it's a prospect on a sales call it's probably going to be things like your pitch when you're covering the main points Things like your price that can be uncomfortable to talk about. It could be a timeline. Think of the important variables where it's really key to get buy-in and sound confident. If you say your price for a program is $10,000, you're going to get objections because it sounds like you are questioning your own price. Okay, We're going to get your results in three to four months. Are you? Doesn't sound like it. <laughs> you sound unsure of yourself. So you're actually asking people to object and question what you're saying when you're using specifically that upward voice inflection when we're going up in pitch. So think of really the things that you need the buy in. You need to sound credible. You need to sound confident and serious. And then, number one, if you're recording these, make sure you're going back and listening whether it's sales call, any type of important meeting, record your voice, go back and listen. And number one, make sure you're not going up. That's going to be the first thing. But even then, more importantly, to optimize that, if you want to sound more credible, make sure you go down a little bit. So the price is $10,000. We're going to get your results here in three to four months. Right where it sounds more assertive and more confident. If we're talking about results and money, I mean, these are important things. These are serious things, sensitive things for some people. So we want to instill a level of certainty when we're speaking about them. And, and that's a great use case and example in the sales process. Would that be, I'm assuming the same thing in fulfillment, same thing with your given direction to a staff. Let's say you have a staff member who is constantly late you know, or constantly not finishing their task on the right time. And if you're like, hey, you were late today? <laughs> that's, a little, that's a little bit different, right? So besides the tone and the inflection at the end of a sentence or at the end of a phrase, are there any additional use cases of how to frame the question? Preframes, reframes, um, any of that type of framing, is that something that also matters when we're also creating this communication? These these boundaries of of um, of intentionality, I'll call them boundaries of intentionality when it comes to communicating. For sure, absolutely, absolutely. There are a few things you can do here. So for staying on track with the voice element, using a tone that is in sync with the message you're trying to get across is key. Especially as leaders, we have team members working for us. Sometimes we might be a little more gentle on them than is going to be effective. And this is something that I struggled with where I was a little bit too nice when I first started hiring people. So even just using a tone and an inflection that does ensure they understand the level of seriousness with what you're talking about. So saying, this is pretty important versus this is important. Sometimes we do have to get a little more serious like that with people when the topic calls for it. And I know like lots of my clients are business owners, they're entrepreneurs, they've got smaller teams, right? They're not necessarily got hundreds of employees yet. And they struggle with this because it feels like it's a little bit of a family. They really want to keep the people that they have. But you have to make sure that you are communicating like a leader which sometimes means having those tougher conversations, which requires the right type of tone. And when it comes to the conversations here, again, 
preframes, reframes. Um, these are these are some of the things that we we've talked about on the on the podcast in the past past episodes. Um, what is is there an intentionality, a posture, if you will, to a preframe? Like we've talked about on the show, something like. Uh, when we're doing a preframe for a combo, using the reprimand as a staff member. It's like, I just want to let you know, you as a human, I love you. I think you're doing great work. I love working with you. I think you're fantastic. And I want you to know what we're going to talk about today has nothing to do with you as a person, has to do with the decisions that you've made. So I'm going to be talking and addressing some of those decisions. And I think it's important for us to make sure that we have an open dialogue there. Is that fair enough? So like that would be an intentional preframe, something we've talked about on pre, you know, previous conversations on the podcast, are there more examples or do you dissect some of this when it comes to communication? Because ultimately, we can have this very intentional, effective conversation, but if it's not being received in a way or if it's going in a different direction or there's rambles, sometimes it could be a miss, even though it was really, if it was filled with the right inflections and the right tones and uh, so maybe you could speak to that or just kind of jam on that just a little bit. 100%. I really like what you did there with that positive preframe. Depending on the circumstance too, it's valuable to be a little more transparent, even if the preframe is a little bit negative. And so saying, hey, I need to have a tough conversation with you. We have something to speak about and it's not going to be pleasant. Like. I don't think sugarcoating things to the way that we've been taught is always effective because if somebody comes into the conversation thinking it's just another la-di-da casual chat and then you're just dropping bombs on them, <laughs> they're not really going to be in the right frame of mind. And so this doesn't mean saying, hey, we're going to have a tough conversation then you book it for two weeks in advance. But letting them know before it actually happens so they can approach it with the right state of mind to discuss things that are, that are a little bit more serious. I found that to be helpful. And just to add another strategy for those types of conversations, I do a lot on paraphrasing and labeling. So where it's it sounds like when they're responding to make sure that the understanding is there. So a lot of times we can say things that make perfect sense to us but it doesn't always make sense to the other person. So doing some sort of paraphrase label where we say, oh, it sounds like you're saying this, or even labeling an emotion, it sounds like you're frustrated here, just making sure everything is very clear, we're all on the same page, we're laying everything out on the table. That's been incredibly effective for myself and a lot of my clients for those types of situations. So let's let, let, let's camp here for just a moment. Um, I know you have a couple of frameworks. If someone is guilty of the rambles, what are what are some of the ways that if I'm listening to this, and you're like, oh, you're talking to me. I am a people pleaser and I like to ramble and sugarcoat. And how might I be able to just have some sort of way for me to practice or role play a framework to help prepare for some of these important conversations that might be coming up? That's a great question. So let's use a framework that fits with our theme of situations we were just talking about where there's some type of problem, right? There's a challenge or something tough that we have to talk about. And so there's a framework that I teach specifically for communicating about problems can be used in any situation. And it's what, so what, now what? We'll break these down one by one. What is, what's going on? What's the actual problem? So this is not a judgment of what's happening. It's not an opinion about what took place or an opinion about the person. It's just very logistically what took place, what are the actual actions and nothing else, okay? So a simple example, let's say the problem is that it started raining. I'm not going to say that, I'm using an easy example, <laughs> you're giving me a look now like, Ty, what do you mean started raining? <laughs> so let's say it started raining and that was the problem that I'm about to talk about. Now, a lot of people would say, oh, I can't believe the weather forecast didn't say it was going to rain. What's, what's going on here? I was preferring sun, la-di-da. And then we get off on all these other tangents. So just simply saying what the problem is, it's raining or you're late. 
Now, the next, so what? Why is this important? So why does this actually matter? Right? This is a step that often gets skipped because we assume everybody knows why things are important. And I use the raining example in particular because if we skip this, people are thinking, what's the problem? So if I say, this is important because I was doing an outdoor event today and all of my displays were starting to get ruined. Or when you're late, it sets a bad example for everyone else on the team and they think that that's acceptable behavior. So now we assume people should know these things, but they often don't. So we need to always say why something is important. That's the so what. The third step is now what. So if we stop at what and so what, then we're kind of just complaining, right? Now what is what are the next steps? What are some suggestions moving forward? How can we actually change this down the road? So for my raining example, I might say, let's call everyone that we know involved with the event and see if they have a tent that we could use or anything else that we could cover up the displays. If somebody is late, we would then give them a plan for, you know, I've even walked through, this is going to sound silly, but hey, what time do you get up in the morning? What time do you set your alarm? How long does it take you to get ready? And then adjusted their morning routine with them to really equip them as easily as possible to actually be on time. And then depending on the severity, here's what's going to happen if you're continuously late. So what, so what, now what? So simple. But what's also so simple to do is also simple to neglect. I really like that, Ty. I'm glad I asked. So, so, so what, so what, now what? Very, very simple framework. And I think that's a really great clip standalone. Uh, that we can use um, to help somebody have a, a clear conversation. So nice work. Is there any other frameworks that you like to share that it, that it could be helpful like those? I really love those tactics. I, I get feedback from our audience. It's like, that was a great tactical, tangible thing that I could take and install right away. And the more I can draw that out of our guests, <laughs> the more our audience and guests like me and they continue to come <laughs> back to the show. I think that's what a, a little bit of a unique trait that we have at our uh, at, at the Better Than Rich show. So I try to try to milk our guests as much value, but I also find that when we give the, the guests and listeners value, they're more likely to take you up on, I know you have an invitation at the end of the episode uh, where they're going to want to stay in touch with you some more. So I like to really kind of give them, give them some of that juice if we can. Yeah, we can definitely give them more juice. If they happen to like you more by sharing frameworks, I will absolutely share another one. <laughs> All right. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. They'll like you more as well. So let's get them to like both of us. That's a win-win right. for sure. Yes, I definitely <laughs> want to be liked yeah. for sure. I always yeah, have stems from my it. childhood. <laughs> so let's 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 go into your framework and then let's talk about your childhood. We can unpack everything <laughs> up here you know, on the Better Than Rich show. So. Yeah, exactly. It'd be a little mini therapy session for Ty after this. <laughs> let's do it. Whatever you're called to. Yeah. So what, what would be another one that you feel is a, is a common uh, like a common trend that you see in humans? It doesn't have to be business general, but humans in general that you're like, this is a common problem that I see people experiencing. And this is a really simple framework that someone could install into their life or into their communication patterns or behaviors that can, that, that can support solving whatever that problem might be. Absolutely. So this is something that I work on when, with pretty much all of my clients because a lot of times when we start talking, we're sort of just rolling the dice, right? We don't always have a plan. We don't really have structure. We're just kind of throwing out words. Sometimes it sounds great. Other times, not so much, right? So it's kind of being left up to chance unless we have some way to organize those thoughts and ideas when we're speaking. So a framework that I teach one of the easiest ones is point, reason, point. Okay? So you should always start with your main point, the main message that you're trying to say. We'll use this simple example to go through this one again here too. Let's say you asked what my favorite movie was. My main point could be my favorite movie is Fight Club. One sentence, one message. That's how I'm starting. 
a lot of times you'll ask that question and people will say, oh, you know, I like a lot of different movies. You know, I'm a comedy guy. You know, there's, um, you know, I watched like super bad when I was a kid. I liked kind of that, you know, slapstick humor. And, uh, oh, there's that movie in the 80s with the tornadoes twister. Really like that movie. Right. But they're kind of all over the place. They're not giving a clear answer. So if you start with just one main point, my favorite movie is X. Great place to start. It's very clear, easy to understand. You expand on that with the reason. So the reason Fight Club's my favorite movie is because I'm a big fan of psychological thrillers. And it's one of the few movies I've ever watched where it's completely different watching it the first time versus the second time. And if you've seen Fight Club, you'll know what I mean. It's also, I'm also a big fan of seeing people get beat up. <laughs> Oddly enough, I don't know what that says about me. But those are the reasons why Fight Club is my favorite movie. So then I'm ending with Fight Club being my favorite movie. Right, restating the point again. Now, it doesn't even have to be that long. You might only have one reason. It could be a quick answer. My favorite movie is Fight Club because young Brad Pitt was my favorite actor. That's why my favorite movie is Fight Club. It can be as simple as that, right? Depending on how much depth and detail you want to get into. So point, reason, point. And that can be used to answer essentially any type of question. There's always going to be a main message at the beginning, some explanation in the middle. And then if you end with your main message, there's a reason that this is so powerful and important in conversations, because there's a couple terms in psychology called the primacy and recency effects. So what that basically means is we remember the things we hear first and the things we hear last the most. So if we start and end with that main point, that's going to be the thing that people are going to remember and take away the most. If I was ending on, let's say, part of my reason, and it was about young Brad Pitt, for example, or that I liked seeing people get beat up, that's probably what you'd respond to, right? You'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm a big UFC fan myself. I also like seeing fights. Or I can't believe you like seeing people get beat up. That's so weird, Ty. Why would you say that? Now we're actually not talking about the question that you asked, right? We veered off to another topic. And this happens all the time because we end with something that's a little bit unrelated. And then people respond to that. That's why a lot of times conversations get way off track way off topic because we're not restating a point at the end and then it can get all over the place. So one of the things that was, uh, as I was listening is I used to teach a framework similar, but I would end it on a question. So that way it keeps the conversation going. So it would be like point reason, point question. Uh, what is your, so that way I kick it back to them. And that way we keep the conversation going. Cause if I end on my point, now the ball is in their court to then ask me another question. Now it almost feels like an interview more than a conversation. What is your take on that? Oh, absolutely. 100%. Yep. It depends on the situation. Most of the time we are going to want to ask questions back. Big fan of keeping conversations going with different types of questions, open-ended questions, that sort of thing. And before we riff on questions, I just wanted to add to point reason point two. If you are in a situation where you need to expand on a point even more and really try to persuade or convince somebody, add an E and make it prep. So point, reason, example, or evidence point. So if you're really trying to persuade, giving an example of, let's say, personal experience, that reinforces your point, or if you have evidence in terms of data or studies or stories, anything like that, then that makes your now point and that framework even more powerful. So for casual conversations and questions, point, reason, point. But then if you're trying to persuade or convince and you have a bit more time to speak, make it prep, point, reason, example, or evidence, point. Great. That's uh, that's really good. I do want to I do want to 
capture some about the questions. And then I have a, a little bit of a pivot. I, I, um, I have a one small pivot in a direction I wanted to go that I, I think it's, maybe it's selfish, but I also think it would be a valuable topic. So let's let's kind of tie a bow. What, what, what were you going to say about questions? I'm interested to hear what you have to say because, again, we've had episodes in the past talking about you know, especially right now with AI and prompts and chat GPT, it's a very relevant topic where the input in is going to generate the output. So the questions that we ask are going to generate the, the output and responses to the questions. So if you ask a shitty question, you're going to get a shitty answer. If you ask, why do I suck? You're going to get a pretty shitty answer. If you ask, how might I improve? You're going to probably get a little bit of a better response. So uh, the questions that we ask is critical of what, as far as from my lens and the teaching that we do, especially with some of the AI coaching and 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 whatnot at this in this chapter in the season that we're in right now. What is what is your you know uh, topic or you know anything that is relevant to you when it comes to what you teach or what you speak about or what your students, whether it's generating through AI or if it's just questions in general. Uh, what what would you say to that? Something that can be a big difference maker is asking the right types of questions to really understand the motivation behind why a person makes decisions the way that they do. So asking things about what about like what about this is most important to you? Or if you could wave a magic wand and everything that you hoped for happened to work out that way, what would that look like for you? So asking different types of questions about best case scenarios, why something is important, that's the insight that whether it's a prospect, a client, a team member, no matter who it is, understanding why people make decisions the way that they do, so useful. And with a couple of those types of questions, you can get great insight into the way that a person thinks and their personality and their values just with a few questions. So those have been an absolute game changer. And and with that information, just to keep on, keep on the train for just a moment. So, okay, I ask questions. Great. Now I understand your values. I understand the lens of the world that you see, but man, that's different than my lens of the world. So you're not seeing the world the way I'm seeing the world. Great. You just gave me some information, but now I have a choice. My choice is, do I want to debate you or do I want to challenge you on your vantage point because yours is different than mine? Do I want to deeper understand you even further? And like, uh, I don't want to question it. I don't want to question why you believe what you're believing or why these are your values, but I do want to understand it even more without sounding interrogative. Uh, I want to try to establish empathy, but at the same time, there's curiosity while not while making sure my questions aren't so biased where I'm imposing my own beliefs onto you, there is a little bit of nuance that could potentially happen on the other end of this conversation example. Um, How does someone navigate this? It feels like it's almost like I have to have so much uh, understanding of human psychology if I want to engage in an intentional conversation. Um, that's That's what I just heard. How do I not get overwhelmed here? Mike, that is such a good question. I wrestle with this on a daily basis. I've now leaned more towards not engaging as much as I used to because I find it takes a lot of mental energy. So when I say not as much as I used to, I'm talking about, you know, small talk with a stranger or an acquaintance and they say a view that I disagree with. I used to maybe ask some questions, try to understand them more, or get into a little bit of a healthy debate. But I found that it wasn't really a net positive, right? You're like, oh, I just spent 20 minutes talking to that person. We both leave thinking the same things. Yeah, I understand them a little bit more, but this doesn't really add any value to my life. So now I'm a lot more probably prone to letting things go and just being like, okay, oh, I see, and not engaging as much. Now, those are for conversations where the topic doesn't really have an impact on my life, right? If it's something that is more meaningful, then something we could all be better at is (laughs) making sure we're asking a lot of questions and fully understanding first 
before jumping in to share our opinions. I'm sure you are deep in this world too, being a podcast host. You're always trying to kind of toe the line. You want to learn about people. You want to push a little bit and gain that information, but you don't want to step on any toes. So I would say reflect on the situations that you're already having and think, do I need to have those conversations? Am I listening enough? Am I talking too much? Should I be asking more questions? Should I be more calm when I'm disagreeing with someone? Just start by reflecting there. You'll get a lot of insights just from that. And you can decide moving forward. Yeah, maybe I want to have less of those. Maybe I don't want to engage in just somebody says something I disagree with. I'll just let it slide. Or maybe I want to become a professional debater and I'm going to disagree with everyone and become as good as Ben Shapiro at debating. And then I'm going to go after him because I disagree with him. Whatever you want to do. I'll I'll leave that part up to the listeners. (laughs) Well, it's interesting because I used to, my, my former business coach, now business partner, we used to have these conversations about how can I become a better debater with understanding what my side of the argument is in all different types of exchanges including with my uh, when, we, when I was dating my my now wife but when we were just dating and then as we entered into marriage like she is way better and in the past was even there the spectrum was like 90 10 but now I feel like I, it's maybe a 60 40 I'm getting a little bit better but I mean it would just crush me she would just absolutely be so firm in her stances and sometimes those weren't exactly my beliefs but I didn't know I wasn't as anchored into my beliefs as I as I, I thought. I wasn't as anchored into my beliefs as she was anchored into hers, let's say. So therefore, it would always move in her direction. So we had, him and I, I Andrew used to have conversations about this. So how can I get more anchored into my beliefs? And then how can I convey and communicate those beliefs more articulate and defend them a little bit? Um, a little bit better. Now, when that obviously is, it comes up in, in a conversation, it's not an argument, it's just a conversation with my spouse. I'm sure I'm going to be needing to do that with my kids. Right now, I have a newborn and a toddler, so we're not quite there yet. Uh, and I know it comes up in business if someone has you know specific questions or, or um, it could be a complaint or it could be a desire for something in the future. They might say, I want this type of result now, but six months ago, they said, I wanted this type of result. And they're coming in hot with saying they want this, they want a new result. And you might need to come in and be like, I want to anchor you to the reason why we established that initial outcome six months ago. And now you're over here saying you want something different. Let's go back. And like, what so, sometimes these types of scenarios are going to show up in our life. So I guess my, my, the, the curiosity in this whole rant here is, how might someone become a better debater for those things that they do have a strong belief in and they do want to fight for and support for, but without the argumentative connotation that goes behind debate? It's not for me to prove you wrong. It's for me to be anchored to these beliefs that do matter to me um, and trying to help you understand them in a way that's not confrontational. Let's see if you could unpack my question there. Absolutely. A couple things. First, I'm very excited for you and your wife to become a 50-50 with with the debate skills because that's going to be really interesting. (laughs) That will be fun. (laughs) And That's why I'm here. So that's why you're on the show. You got to (laughs) get, I need that extra 10% edge. Come on, Ty. (laughs) Hopefully we'll, we'll get you to 41 maybe after this, you know, a couple more episodes. You'll be there in no time. (laughs) <laughs> deal. <laughs> That's really the key. Something that you said there was debating without making it confrontational. That's something that a lot of people really struggle with. And the reason that they struggle with that is because they are trying to win or trying to do the best job possible at explaining their side. So they're very focused on themselves, their ideas. They want to really persuade and convince and try to do the best job possible. But what ends up happening is that when both people do that, 
they're both a little bit closed off and there's some resistance there. So I've been quite a few of these types of situations and the most success I've ever had is when I talk very little for the first half, let's say, of the conversation and I'm only asking questions. So the person probably wouldn't even know my side until we've already been talking for a while. Cause I'm just really trying to understand. I'm asking questions, doing the labeling and the paraphrasing we talked about where I'm saying it sounds like, and then even if my, it sounds like is wrong, they're always going to correct me. So then that increases my understanding too. And then it's not until I believe I've done everything I can to see exactly where they're coming from. It's kind of empathy at its core, which is, doing everything possible to not agree with the other person, but to understand the other person. And the secret sauce in here is that when you do this, they feel like you care, right? They don't feel like it's a debate because you've spent so much time focusing on them and they feel valued. They feel heard. So then now when you are talking about your side, they're going to be so much more receptive and it's a lot easier to find some sort of common ground. Okay, we disagree on this part, but we're kind of on the same side here and we can have a little bit more of a give and take. That way, truly, that's going to be the biggest difference maker. And it's really hard to do because we get emotional. We get a little bit revved up, jacked up. We want to change their mind. We feel strong about our beliefs. But that's just not an effective way of having those types of conversations. So just even keeping the pace slow, pausing, slowly asking your questions, slowly labeling until you really feel like you've done everything you can, then you can share your ideas. And this is why it's important listener to be emotionally grounded <clears throat> and also not expelling energy on meaningless conversations. Like Ty was saying, if you're expelling energy on these conversations that are surface level or not really getting to a place that you want, or you're expelling energy on you fill in the blank, then we can't really show up. We're going to get emotionally fatigued a lot quicker and triggered a lot quicker in some of these meaningful and impactful conversations. So it's almost like the choose your battle, choose your argument, choose your stance. Those are those are some important things that I, I, I'm pulling out of this conversation, Ty. I want to make sure I hit on that one question that I didn't ask, and uh, then uh, we'll, we'll you know, start kind of heading towards the exits here in a moment. But uh, I wanted to ask you this, because I felt this in the past. I would go to like networking meetings or podcasting events, or, or um, you know, there, and there'd be some pretty prominent individuals there. And there, in the past, I would have like this imposter syndrome feeling where I would feel, man, this person is really important. This person is a higher up. This person is an authority in the space. So sometimes I would find myself projecting on some sort of insecurity when I what isn't as aligned or in integrity with, with my authenticity, with what, what is the value that I do bring to this conversation. So if a listener is feeling this where they're, they're courting a high ticket client or a prospect that they know this is a huge account, but this is an authority. They're an expert at this, but I know I'm an expert at what I'm an expert at. And I know I could earn their business or they're going to a networking meeting and they want to create an affiliate partnership with someone who's, you know, a high net worth or a high, a, high, a very uh, attractive figure. And they're like, ah, oh, I, I need a, I need to posture myself a certain way. What is, what is the counsel that you might give to someone on how to make sure they speak concisely, making sure they could be understood, and making sure that they could be viewed as an equal to someone who might be an authority figure? Yeah, it's really interesting because it's all relative. There's probably people that would meet you and then put you on that pedestal even, Mike, right? Maybe it's somebody that just started their first podcast, they've been listening from the beginning, and then meeting you, they come up to you and you can tell they're like kind of nervous and, you know, just really trying to impress you. You can feel that they're devaluing themselves, right? And so this is all relative. It's easy for me to say, just remember that they're all human. They're all just like you. 
remember that people can sniff that. So one of the best ways to not come across that way is to, I always start with making things nice and light at the beginning of a conversation like that, getting them to talk about something that they like or that they're interested in. I'm not trying to posture myself or say much of anything at the beginning, kind of like the negotiation. I am trying to ask them a couple questions just to get them talking about something that they like or something that they're excited about. So after a quick introduction, great questions are, what's something exciting that you're working on right now? Or what was the best part of your week? What was the best part of your summer? If it's the end of summer. Something like that that gets them talking about something positive, something that they like. And then you can see when they're relaxed, they're talking about something that they find enjoyable or interesting. It just has a good natured, casual feel to that type of conversation. That's just going to take a lot of pressure off because you will be able to see, oh, they're enjoying this conversation with me. This is great. The last thing we want to do is show up and make it seem like they're bored with us or they don't want to talk to us. So if we can have those types of conversation topics right off the bat, something they're excited about, what was the best part of insert anything here? What was the highlight of same thing, your week, your month, whatever it might be, your day. It forces them into a positive topic. And then from there, you'll just be loose er anyways. You won't feel like you have to posture because you're going to feel that they kind of like you. And then from there, it's, it's way more smooth sailing. I still feel like this sometimes, and this is what I do anytime I'm speaking to somebody like that, that like, like that. Maybe I feel like that right now. I just stumbled. I think I might feel that way about you, Mike. <laughs> hey, it, it wouldn't be the first, uh, but uh, I'm just teasing. It's interesting you say this because one of the things that I uh, heard is like if I, I, I had a conversation with, with someone, I said, if I had a conversation with Tony Robbins and he was right there, like I'm not prepared for this combo. Like I want to make sure that I am very equipped on what, how intentional would I be if I, if I had this conversation with him? And they said, just remember, someone used to change his diapers. So, so now that I have like this newborn, I'm changing her diapers. Sometimes I'll think about, man, every human once was so dependent on another human and somebody else has changed their diapers. So when you said we're all humans, that's kind of the framework of they were, there was a high dependency at some point in time. Uh, so uh, th that's just a small little uh, thing that, 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 just popped in my head when you said that. Ty, we've gone in a lot of different directions here. Um, I'm curious if there was anything that we did not capture today that you're like, man, Mike, I really would have liked to share this, or I think this would be really important for context whether, you know, on anything that we didn't capture in this conversation so far before we transition into the uh, final three questions and then giving our listener a chance to know where they could find you. And I know you have a free gift for them as well. That's a good question. I feel like we covered the bases really well here. I will add something about meeting a person that we f might view as more important than us. You mentioned too, how do we come across as clear and concise when speaking around them? This is where I'm absolutely going to encourage everyone to use the frameworks, right? You can train your brain to think in terms of a point, reason, point, something like that, so that when you get asked a question, if you're thinking more, okay, what's my main point? Why do I think this? Let me restate the point. If you give nice, short, clear, concise answers, you're going to feel good about how you're communicating to this person because we don't want to feel like we're wasting their time or rambling or anything like that. So follow the frameworks, practice the frameworks, and prepare your whatever elevator pitch intro, they're going to ask some version of who you are, what do you do, something like that if you've never met them. So just really practice those few sentences because if you start and you stumble a little bit, you're going to be totally thrown off for the rest of that conversation. It's the same with anyone. When somebody asks, hey, what do you do? Right? We get asked that all the time. I think it's a boring, terrible question. I think there's a lot better questions, but we get asked it all the time. And so you should have that nailed where you just, every word is perfect. And then if you start strong like that, everything's just going to feel a lot easier. That'll be a great and very easy way just to follow those couple things we talked about with actually anyone 
in a conversation. Nice. And making sure that if you meet a Canadian, always start the conversation with A because they really love that is what I'm heard. And they never actually heard that before. Um, It's one of the more original jokes that you could (laughs) say to any Canadian. So the more, the better. (laughs) So, uh, Ty, this is fun. Uh, We ask every guest three questions. These will be short hitting top of mind, which is up for you. Uh, The first question we like to ask is, what do you think the world needs most today? I was going to say honesty and truth telling, especially from our prominent figures, but I was just listening to a previous episode. It was the, it was the courage coach and that was his answer. So I'm not going to give the same answer of honesty, even though that is what came to my mind first. I'm going to say the world needs more optimism, not necessarily toxic positivity, not wearing rose-colored glasses and ignoring things that are going on, but optimism. So having a hope and a positive outlook that things can get better. There's a lot going on in the world right now, and if we can approach each day with a little bit more optimism, that'll give us a bit more fuel in the tank just to keep showing up every day and doing what we have to do. That's great. And that was Laban Ditchburn, who's the Courage Coach. Uh, for anybody who want to check out his response on honesty. Uh, number two, what are one to three books that you think people should read? There's two books that I keep coming back to and rereading every couple of years. The first is The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And the second is Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. So those books have done a lot just for changing the way that I think about life. They can change the way that you think about communication and the way that you interpret and react to others' communication in general. So those two books have had the biggest impact on me. That's great. And listen, you notice how you did point, reason, point. Uh, So that was really good. (laughs) Uh, And uh, number number three uh, is what does it mean to you to be better than rich? For me, it means reaching my potential in all areas of life. It's a great response. Ty, I'm sure people are going to want to stay in touch with you. And I know you mentioned to me before we click record about your free training. You have a, you have a free training that you can give to our listeners. Can you tell us a little bit about that and where you want people to stay in touch? Definitely. So if you ever do video calls, throughout your day, whether it's for work, personal, whatever it might be, this is going to be a training that you would find helpful. It's called Five Science-Backed Video Call Secrets. Every professional needs to know. And these are easy things you can do actually in the first 30 seconds of a video call to be seen as more confident, to build trust, to increase connection, lots of good stuff there. And it's a very short training, very digestible that can be gotten for free at videocallstar.com. I like the link videocallstar.com. We'll definitely put that in the show notes. And I would take them up, listener. If you made it to the end of this episode, uh, I mean, why not? It's number one, it's a free training. But man, there's a lot of really great conversations uh, that like different topics that we went into, these different frameworks. I could only imagine uh, what, what, what Ty has to offer. So Ty, thanks so much for bringing value today and, uh, you know, really allowing us to pull out some of these tactical tools and your wisdom and expertise. Uh, so that way our audience is, uh, excited to stay in touch with you, Ty. So thank you so much. And listener, obviously thank you for supporting the show and supporting the podcast. Uh, I know, uh, as many of you have seen, I've said this on the end of the most free, recent episodes, is that we're going through a rebrand with our name from Better Than Rich to Time Rich. Better Than Rich is still going to be the umbrella company uh, and our brand, but underneath Better Than Rich is going to be Time Rich. So a lot of content has been coming your way about the Time Rich 6, which is boundaries, communication guidelines, systems, playbooks, team and tech. There's been uh, the, the predictable playbooks have been coming probably through your inbox as well. Uh, some of the summits on how to buy back 30 hours in 30 days. 
um, and showing you exactly how to do that. So a lot of that's coming your way. Right now, also, we are doing free 90-day delegation planning sessions for anybody that wants to get some things offloaded from their business. Uh, and you could go to betterthanrich.com slash 90-day plan. That's 90-day plan. We'll do a time audit for you. And then if you, most of you that are listening are using our virtual assistant services, but if you need any support there, we have 30 to 40 virtual assistants ready to go. We could install them into your business and we could have that conversation if you need anything like podcast production, video editing, uh, administrative, social media, any type of podcast guesting. If you want to get on other people's shows, we have formulas and playbooks and, and a team that's ready to execute on your behalf. So again, betterthanrich.com slash 90 day plan. Again, listener, thank you for joining the show. Ty, thank you so much for uh, sharing your wisdom today. And as always, leave today better than you found it. Till next week.